I don't know if you're a big fan of the Kurt uh, Russell, uh, Kurt Russell uh, film, uh, The Thing. Uh, well, I mean, he was the star. You know what I mean? I'd like take that as a yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the very thing. much oh. so. Oh, you got to be fucking kidding me. Are you fucking kidding me right now? A lot's happened since yesterday. Yo, what's up, people? Welcome to another edition of A Lot's Happened Since Yesterday. My name is Ralph Busso. My name is Cody Walker. Make sure you're supporting the show. Make sure you're hitting the like button. Make sure you're hitting the subscribe button. Make sure you're joining up to Facebook. Remember, we're everywhere you ought to be. I think that's an actual motto. Never mind. Don't remember I said that. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really excited to have. Uh, I found Mike in the play, one of the low... Last places I'd expect to look because I'm not necessarily a TikTok fan because to me, TikTok is a bunch of dancing chicks and, you know, cooking videos or whatever the hell they do on there. And I'm <laughs> and I'm sliding through and all of a sudden I hear, hey, TikTok props to history. And I'm like, who's this guy? And that's where I found him. So we're going to get into who Mike is. Mike, Corey, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. How are you guys? Excellent. Excellent. Mike, you will be better at telling people what you do than I will. I will fumble fuck the whole thing. So let, <laughs> let, let, let's include, let's tell people what exactly you do. Well, as you said, my name is Michael Corey. I'm better known online as Props to History. I am a prop maker, costume maker, and special effects technician, but I specialize in the history of props and film and filmmaking. And I tell the stories of props, special effects, and the people that make it happen behind the scenes in film. Uh, and I do so through TikTok and YouTube and all social media. But I'm uh, I'm a hobbyist that became a professional as the the short the short form of what I do. <laughs> wow, that's really cool, brother. I I I, I got to admit I I'm I'm a little bit envious. That's fucking <laughs> cool that you were able to take your hobby and turn it into a profession is amazing. Mm -hmm. And that's what this show is all about, really, is people being able to turn their hobbies into professions. Tell me a little bit about what's behind you, Bo. I, I, I got to know what's up with that one right there. The, Which one? Well, you've got you've got the Tron. You got the Tron helmet on one side. You've yeah, got the suit got, of armor. That yeah, right there is the. Both the, of those, the two standing guys right there, I need to know about. Oh, these guys? Yeah. I so the one with the yellow helmet is a, a back suit from The Expanse Season 2. Um, I built that with the help of the prop master of the expanse. Uh, and they actually sent me all of the, um, the graphics used on the suits. Uh, so all the graphics, the decals, the markings are all from the show. Everything else was made by me. The purple armor next to it is actually from the uh, 2017 movie, Great Wall. It's with Matt Damon and Pedro Pascal. Oh, okay. And that's uh, it's a screen used set of armor, background armor, but made by Weta, who did all the special effects and, and props and costuming for Lord of the Rings. So it's immaculate in every way. And, and then uh, Gizmodic Institute helmet is the yellow one. Uh, Kylo Ren, which is actually a casting from the production molds. And then above that is an X-Wing helmet made from the uh, original parts they used in the 70s to make them. And then over here, we have the helmet from Tron, 1982. So... Um, and then Doctor Who's scarf, because why not? And then this whole case nuts. behind yeah. me is full of stuff from Tarantino films, The Muppets, The Matrix. Uh, uh, John you a Tarantino Wick. fan? I very much am. Okay. I've been to, uh, I have, I can't say any details about it, but I have been to uh, Tarantino's and Robert Rodriguez's um, special effects house where all of the props are stored from Robert Rodriguez's films. And I've, I will let this out of the bag. I've held the original Hattori Hanzo sword from Kill Bill. Oh, you son of a oh, bitch. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh. um, it, it, but it's, it, it, I've, what happened with TikTok has given me access to so many different people and places within the film industry that no one, quite frankly, knows about unless they're in the industry. And like, I, I, I've met all of these makers that, have never gotten the credit on screen, but have made some of the most iconic pieces in film history. The, the hook from Hook, uh, the um, Robert Williams film, um, 
the gentleman that made that, his name is Tony Swatton, and he's a blacksmith of absolutely peerless uh, skill. Mm -hmm. And he made the hooks for that. But when I went to visit his shop, he had one of the hooks still there. And uh, he also made all the swords for Pirates of the Caribbean. Wow. And he had all of the uh, principal photography swords. They're called hero swords, all made out of metal for all the main characters just laying on a shelf. And he just picked them all up and handed them to me. And he said, these are the hero swords from Pirates of the Caribbean. And <laughs> it was Johnny Depp's, Orlando Bloom's, Barbosa's, uh, all of them, all their hero swords. And he just handed them to me like they were nothing. And then I handed them back to him after I drooled on them for a little while. <laughs> and then he just sort of dropped them on the shelf where they came from. Because <laughs> oh. they're just things to him. But, you know, to film fans, they're these these uh, unbelievable pieces of film history. And But he's these are the kind of people that, that make this stuff. That a lot of people never hear about. And I love telling their stories because so many people don't even know how movies are made, much less who's involved. Right, right. There's so much behind the scenes and so mm -hmm. many people that make the movie drive that isn't, like you said, Johnny Depp or Orlando Bloom. Oh, yeah. Those guys are great. They do their job and they're the top of their game. But how many people are there before they even take step before the move to make that movie? Oh, happen? yeah. I mean, there's a thing called pre-production that goes on for months, sometimes years, yeah. before a camera even gets put on a tripod. So it's... Uh, there's thousands and thousands of people directly and indirectly involved with every movie made, um, particularly then the bigger the budget, the more people involved. So uh, with a movie like take, for instance, uh, Schindler's List, um, there were easily 10, 15,000 people involved in some way in that movie. Mm -hmm. And this, the credits only have a thousand people in it, you know, so yeah. you don't even know the names of everyone involved and, and, those stories are there and those stories are interesting and they're riveting in some cases, the things that have to be done to make a movie happen. Yeah. And, and I really enjoy that side of it more than the actor side of it. Why do you think I, they're left out of the credits? I'm just curious. Well, a lot of times it's, it's, it comes down to there's not enough room <laughs> and, and also like the way negotiations are done about who ends up in credits, who's required to end up in credits, who isn't required. Uh, there's a lot of rules uh, involving who ends up and who doesn't end up in the credits of a film. Is and, that for time um, constraints to keep it from being like a three hour long credit scene? Uh, sometimes I guess it could be that, but a lot of times it's uh, like, I'll just speak from the point of view of props. Um, if I get contracted to make a prop for a prop house, that rents props to a production. Mm -hmm. I may have been directly involved in making props for that film, but I was a contractor. Mm -hmm. So the studio deals directly with the prop house. They don't deal with me. So I'm not a person that the studio knows about. So I'm not gonna end up in the credits because I'm a contractor. And for a lot of people, their role in a film, it, they may be as a contractor. So. The studio is not going to deal with them. The producer is not going to deal with them. So they don't even know that they're real. You know, they're aware of their existence, maybe, but they're not directly involved in that realm. So they're not going to end up in the credits because of it. Okay. See, I thought, so, so what exactly, so is the prop house just the place they store the props in? Like, yeah, how does that work? Okay. So there's, there's these, there are these, there are these to me, anyway there's these magical places all over wherever uh, movies are made when a film let's let's take a period piece like apocalypse now when apocalypse now was filming they film in the philippines mm -hmm. they had to find military equipment for a thousand soldiers both sides of the of the conflict where do they get that stuff? Hollywood doesn't you know a production company doesn't store that stuff they don't keep it they don't have it on hand they don't maintain it. It's too much over too many movies. So there's these wonderful places called prop houses that maintain these massive collections of furniture, clothing, equipment, uh, cameras, computers, guitars, you, whatever you can think of. There is a prop house that specializes in that. And one of them that I go to a lot that I uh, have a good relationship with is called History for Hire. And the first movie they ever uh, propped was apocalypse now and you can tell because they have hundreds and hundreds of complete sets 
of Vietnam era equipment that was all used in Apocalypse Now and then was used in a hundred other movies because they just kept, it just kept getting rented out. So when a production needs stuff, they go to these prop houses and they rent it. And there are prop houses that specialize in everything. There's a prop house I went into, their whole specialization was street lights. Okay. And they had, they had street lights from every era, uh, uh, either like uh, pitch or candle or uh, steam powered lights, which were a thing at one time, uh, you know, electric lights from every era, from so many different countries and cultures. But that was their thing was street lights. And then there's another prop house that all they deal in is eyeglasses and they make custom eyeglasses for movies. That's their thing. And then you have prop houses like History for Hire that is very much uh, period related stuff or ISS props, which they have the largest armory uh, private armory in the world of live fire weapons used in film. And um, they just, they have all walks of life of props from cameras to clothing, etc. And then they have their, their vice area with fake drugs and fake alcohol and all that sort of stuff. So it, these, there's, there's hundreds of these prop houses all over the United States. And a lot of them right near you guys in California. Right. Um, lots of them in Atlanta, in Austin, New York, et cetera, wherever there's big film productions, you'll find them. But I love those places because you never know what you're going to find. I walked around the corner in history for hire one day and there's two atomic bombs sitting there. <laughs> and, and legitimately that's what they were. It was fat man and little boy from fat man and little boy, the movie itself. Holy so, crap. So, so, okay, so prop houses are where they store the props that have been made. And then if there's something they can't find or they need special, they go to contractors and have them build it. Yeah, or they'll go to the prop houses themselves too because the prop houses have build facilities in them for the most okay. part. They have places where they can build custom stuff or if it's something very specialized or you know they don't want to deal with a prop house or there's not one available, then they'll go to somebody like me who will build it. Right, because as much as there is in prop houses, there's still stuff they don't have. That's so that 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 that's so crazy that we're talking about this because I've never been in a movie, but I was on a television show. A, it was a, it was a pilot series. Two episodes were filmed. Uh, we went to England and Salem, Massachusetts, and uh, when we went to England, they had to build a rack for as a prop. Mm -hmm. for, for the show and so and, and so they had somebody, a like a torture rack yeah they had okay. somebody design it you know what i mean yep. so it's, it's it's funny it's like you you probably might know that person i don't know <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's it's like it's a small world when you start to think about it but that's it really that's, is yeah yeah that's it so really wild is. though man there's i that that's so much great information thank you for sharing that with us Mike. of course yeah you heard it here and a lot's happened since yesterday. So uh, you're learning some shit about the behind the scenes in the entertainment movie industry. Um, this is really cool stuff. Uh, Mike, what else are you into? I know you're a film historian. Uh, wh what is it that drove you to become a film historian? Well, I, uh, it goes all the way back to when I was a kid, actually. I, um, I got started building models. Uh, because my dad was a model builder. And uh, one day I caught a, a show on PBS about the making of 2001 A Space Odyssey. And they showed how the filming models for the mothership and the different spaceships were made. And it grabbed my attention that it, they use a process called kit bashing, where they build a form and then they detail it with pieces from plastic model kits. They just pull them off the sprues of a plastic model kit and glue them on. And I became more and more interested in model making from that perspective, scratch building, kit bashing, et cetera. I built models professionally for a little while. And hmm. that moved into, after several years, into the study of those models and the props. And then one day somebody said, asked me if I could build a costume, which I'd never done. And I built a costume for a horse. A, um, an ADAT costume from Star Wars for a 2,000 pound Clydesdale. And it ended up going viral. Have, I was just uh, to say, have I seen this? This sounds very, yeah, holy shit, yeah, was that you? That was me, yeah, <laughs> that was fuck, me. Dude. Uh, and uh, it, it went viral uh, way more than I expected because I thought maybe a couple hundred people might think it was funny. 
And it ended up, according to the last time I looked, Facebook's algorithm, it's been viewed by like 46 million people or some Holy nonsense. Crap, dude. And that's just from them. I, I ended up being in the New York Post. I was on, there was an article written about it on CNET, all this kind of stuff. And I started posting my stuff online after that because I realized that was a thing. And then um, I got more heavily into movie props and the history behind movie props and started building exacting replicas of them. And then one day a guy I worked with said, Hey, you should get on TikTok." And I was like very much like a lot of people in my age category, which I imagine you guys are pretty close to. Um, I thought TikTok was for teenagers. I, I, I'm 23. Just so you know. Yeah, no, you're nowhere near my age. Group. <laughs> 23 and me. Actually. I'm 23 yeah. and dog ears, but <laughs> yeah. How old are you then? I'm like, I'm in my late thirties, early fifties, you know, somewhere okay, between. Yeah. No, I'm yeah, 40. I'm 40. The, I, we're, did you ever, did you play with GI Joe's? Fuck yes. I play with GI Joe's. <laughs> then we're in the yeah, same. Yeah. We're, we're, we, we're from the same class. I got excited yeah. when I saw the Tron. I'll say that. I got yeah. excited when yeah, I saw okay. the Tron. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the same <laughs> bracket. But um, I thought it was for teenagers and I didn't really think anything of it. So eventually they badgered me enough to do it. And I posted my first video, which was about the book of the dead from the mummy from 1999. And it blew up. And it went extremely viral. And now here I am, that was six months ago. I'm at a quarter million followers now. But in the process of that, I caught the eye of several prop masters. And oh, yeah. prop master is a very specific term. It's during the production of a film or TV show, the prop master oversees each scene and makes sure that the props that are needed are there. And they acquire them in whatever way they have to, to make sure they're available each shooting day for that scene. And because of that, access opened to prop houses, prop shops, prop makers, prop masters. And I started getting my first film work. And oh, yes. now my very first prop that I ever made for a major production, because I'd made some stuff for independent film before. I'd worked on a couple of little indie films that had no budget, you know, beer and pizza was your pay kind of budget. And, um, but this was my Magnum PI, uh, season four, episode two of Magnum PI. Uh, the prop master, John Harrington, contacted me and said, can you build a helicopter radio? And in TV, if anybody watching this ever worked anything in TV, they know that TV shows need everything now. And he said, can you build a helicopter radio from scratch <laughs> that we can then pull a card out of to make it look like it was disabled? You need to make the cards too. You have four days. So I designed and built a, a, a helicopter radio that did exactly what they wanted to do. And what was it? Two weeks ago, it was on TV. Okay, so, wait, 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 wait. So how does this process work? Are you just sitting in your house and your phone rings and you're just like, oh, shit, I yeah, got to go. That, yeah, that's actually more or less how it works. It's sort of the short version of how it worked. John called me and said, have you ever built a helicopter radio? And I used to be an aircraft mechanic. So in a way, I had. And I said, well, yeah, more or less. He said, I need this radio. Here's the model number. Build one that does this. You know, gave me the specific, uh, specific specifics of what it needed to do. And I said, okay. So I built it, sent him pictures. The art director said, yay. I put it in a box and, they sh and shipped it to Hawaii <laughs> uh, over the span of about four days. So that was that's how that worked. And then the next prop they came up with, uh, which hasn't aired yet. Oh, no, it has aired now. It actually aired yesterday. Um, was an injector, like a secret injector. There, He's like, do you have a lathe? Yes. Machine up this thing that does this, that has a fake hypodermic needle in it that disappears when it touches skin, etc. And I said, okay. So I machined that up. Two days later, it was in the mail. Uh, and this is the week before the episode is filmed is when I'm getting this. So... Right up to the last minute, everything changed. I was this close. So you're you're just a badass motherfucker. Is basically what you're what you're saying. <laughs> yes. uh, you're uh, a yes, badass yes. motherfucker that does shit. When they <laughs> ask you to do it, you get it fucking done. That, that is true. That is that true. Is fucking cool, dude. Yeah, I was this close <laughs> yeah, to getting some work, uh, to getting a, a prop job on uh, a Marvel Legends. Oh, oh my god, god. I love and it. this is and this is an example of how TV works. I was, we were down to the day that we'd agreed on price, everything. The writers changed their mind about the scene and my work was no longer needed. So, <laughs> Holy crap, dude. Yeah, and that happens. 
that's the biz, right? You know, yeah, I mean? that's the biz. So shit, man, dude, yeah. fucking awesome, man. I yeah. don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time, brother. I don't know how much longer you've got to go, but um, it's been great talking to you, dude. This is great this talking is, to you too. This is really cool shit, man. A lot of people don't know about this. I just, I just want to know what inspired you to get into building models and prop making all together from the start. Yeah, was it movie I, I, props or was it? Um, a, I, did you start building before the movies, or did the movies inspire you to start building? It was, it was before that. Um, it was, it was my, it was a, a hobby that I shared with my dad. Okay. Uh, oh, right building models. It was that. It was that sort of bond thing that I had with my dad was models because that was very much his thing and and then he passed that on to me and i kept doing that and you know i was that dorky nerdy teenager that still built models and played D and magic the gathering and all that shit <laughs> all through high school yeah. and uh, i was not popular with the ladies when i was in high school <laughs> so um but i've i've since managed to turn that into working on movie props only because i love film i love history i love making is what it comes down to. Like all this stuff I'm surrounded by these props. This is in here because yes, I like it, but it's in here because other people like it and they'll see it and they'll go, Oh, this is the kind of thing that can be made. This is really just sort of the eye candy for the yeah. shop. I love collecting, but I could sell all this stuff tomorrow and not feel bad about it because they're just things. I like the process of building. I love the process of making and that and knowing that what I'm making is helping tell a story adds to it. So the enjoyment for me is twofold, the build, and then it's involved in a story. So that's, that's why I'm so inspired to do the stuff I do and why, yes, this is a job. And yes, it's stressful owning my own business. And yes, it's a pain in the ass sometimes, but I love coming into work, uh, which I won't, I'll, I'll, I won't trade that for anything. Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Is there a, how would I, is there like a holy grail of a prop to you? Yes. Yes, there is. Okay. Uh, and, I have, and I have built 12 iterations of it to try and perfect it. Uh, and it's the four stones from the fifth element. Um, oh, now you're speaking our language. So <laughs> I absolutely love the fifth element uh, for a lot of reasons and the stones were the first prop that I ever looked at and said I want to replicate those because I love the look of them just everything about them just struck a chord with me and there's only one known set used in the movie that still survives and they're owned by Luke Besson the director of the film so the likelihood is I'll never get my hands on them, but I've been trying to perfect the stones from the fifth element for years. It's impossible. They change scene to scene. So there's no, there's no one set of stones, but, and they change size too. They get bigger and smaller depending on which scene it is. Right. Um, but after production, a lot of the props from the fifth element were destroyed uh, under orders by Luke Besson because he didn't want to see his work in another film. So that's why a lot of stuff, just like Stanley Kubrick had so much of his stuff destroyed. He didn't want other filmmakers using it. That's why Cecil B. DeMille dynamited an entire city so that other, <laughs> uh, other, uh, other filmmakers couldn't use it. Now, is that considered an industry dick move? Um, yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, but it's, a not, it's not an unexpected move in some cases. Um, with Cecil B. DeMille, uh, he built the city of Pharaohs back in the 20s out in Baja, California and um, out in the desert there near the, the dunes and stuff. And he it was months of construction, concrete, plaster, everything. Massive city, uh, ancient Egyptian city. And the agreement was that he'd get rid of it after filming was done. He'd move it. Well, it was massive. It was an enormous city. So instead of taking it all down, or maybe leaving it for other filmmakers because other filmmakers had asked for in had, had, had expressed interest in using it. He had the whole city dynamited and then buried in the sand. <laughs> and they still, they're still digging up pieces of it <laughs> to this day. And those pieces end up going to museums because it's a part of this film. But yeah, he's, uh, he just had the whole city dynamited when it was done. And oh, I just, crap. all That's this work, all this work for three weeks of filming. That was it. Um, That's crazy. I wanted to touch on the, the union problems that you guys were talking about. Yeah. What was, what was that about? Because you had mentioned something about the contractors union is what it or was it proper's? 
So it's it's Proper. what's called IATSE, the I A T S E. Uh, it's the 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 union that oversees um, background uh, behind the scenes workers, essentially, right. and it covers all kinds of people, uh, the whole width of the. And as as everybody knows, there's the ongoing possibility of a strike and the negotiations with the um, AMPTP, which is the basically the producers about getting fair pay and turnaround time and that sort of thing, which turnaround time is from the time you leave the set till the time you come back, lunch breaks, essential. And the union voted 98% to strike, which is unprecedented. Ooh. And the union hasn't struck since 1945, I believe. And they came to a tentative agreement. So we're waiting to see what happens there because that could shut down everything. The whole, because the writers guild, the screen actors guild, all of them have jumped on board and said, we're going to support you. If you guys go on strike, we're going on strike. Oh, so everything shuts down. Everything will shut down. All of Hollywood will shut down. So I, I'm waiting to see what happens there. Um, they have a tentative agreement. So the strike was actually supposed to happen yesterday, uh, but it's on hold right now. And it's waiting for the union members to vote as to whether they're going to strike or not. So um, the whole thing is still very much tentative and uh, some people are still nervous about it. A lot of people are still angry about the agreement that was made, but we'll it's see what happens. Is it good enough? Is, is it just not good it's, enough? It's, they've never had this kind of hold. They've never had this kind of leverage. And some people in the union, and I'm only speaking for what I've read online, not for anyone specific. Some people feel that now is the time to get everything that they possibly can from these giants of media, these multi-billion dollar corporations. But at the same time, they're also multi-billion dollar corporations. Yeah. And fighting them because the rules get bent towards them all the time, it's very hard to fight something like that. So I'm not sure how it's all going to play out yet. And a lot of people are, on a, are unclear how it's going to end up. So we'll probably have to wait till January until anything really truly happens. Um, but it is, the whole thing is unprecedented because we have this massive strike that very nearly took place with Hollywood. And now we have this massive strike going on with John Deere, yeah. these massive strikes going on with um, Kellogg's and all these people all over the, the country quitting their low paying jobs. And it's it seems like it's the, the great resignation, some people are calling it. And um, I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes from the standpoint of how workers are benefit from it. Yeah. So, um, but everything's still a question mark. So we'll see how it plays out, but um, hopefully we can, it'll work out in the favor of, of everybody and everybody will come off better for this. And, um, and then hopefully we can get some legislation passed here in Indiana to get some tax incentives so that I can start uh, making stuff here in Indiana. I'm not having to go to LA for it. <laughs> oh yeah, because that make your life a lot easier. It would absolutely. How, how does that work? Every, every every state that has film productions in it has tax incentives that interest that gain like that attract film project projects. Indiana doesn't have any, so any work that I do comes from Atlanta or Austin or L.A. or any of the major places where film is done. And I'm right now. I'm trying to work with Senator Senator Justin Bush to get legislation passed to change that, to bring that in, to get tax incentives passed. The last legislative session, it almost passed. So I'm trying to use whatever modicum of influence I have to get people to contact their senators to say, hey, vote for this, because it will bring in jobs, it will bring in infrastructure, and it will benefit the people of the state of Indiana. There's tons of talent in the state of Indiana for film and theater and music, and this legislation will bring in tax benefits for the film industry and the music industry. So it, it all around is a better thing for Indiana. All right, people, you heard it. Get over there and get over there and write your senators and tell them to do that shit. Cause hell yeah, dude, you guys, need all the <laughs> need, you bring them, man. I mean, that I don't understand why all States aren't doing that. That's money to be made, dude. I mean, so it's, it's, it's old ways of thinking. And, um, and I, I've heard, I've heard not necessarily in Indiana. I've heard some politicians say that they believe that, that uh, film projects bring in drugs. <laughs> yeah. So, because apparently it's, you know, well, reefer yeah, madness when the movie <laughs> show up. <laughs> I don't know. It's just it, a lot of, some people hear tax breaks and tax incentives and they get upset by it, but then they don't have a problem giving tax breaks to the people that give them donations for their campaigns. So, yeah. Who's yeah. to say? 
I said I wasn't going to get political, and then I did. My apologies. Yeah. Okay, I'll cut. Like I said, I'll cut it, man. If you want me to no, cut it, cool. I would just <laughs> leave it. In. Leave it. That pardon. Okay. If you ever get involved in uh, special special effects, you know what I yeah. mean. Yeah, I'm actually doing a bunch of uh, uh, SFX for um, uh, a couple of indie films here. I did some uh, pyrotechnic work on a small sci-fi film. I actually built the filming models, a big spaceship filming model, and then blew it up uh, when it was done. Uh, for a student film, actually. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not licensed to do pyrotechnics, but I've been, I've been there <laughs> uh, when it gets done. But there are specific licensing for pyrotechnics. So, um, but I've done gore work. I've done, um, you know, stab weapons and stunt props or uh, um, st like stunt tools, bludgeoning weapons, that sort of thing. Uh, so, yeah, I do get involved in, in SFX occasionally. It's not my specialty, but I do get into it. Occasionally. Well, but what I mean, what are you, is that something that you would get into if you had the opportunity? Like, um, I don't know if you're a big fan of the Kurt, uh, Russell, uh, Kurt Russell uh, film, uh, The Thing. Uh, well, he, he was the star. You know what I mean? I'll, the, I'll take that as a yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the very thing. much so. <laughs> Oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Are you fucking kidding me right now? No fucking way. I'm done, guys. I'm done. That's it. That's all for me. I so, fucking love that movie. You have no so idea. 1982 no idea. thing, in my opinion, uh, mm. is a magnum opus. It is an absolutely brilliant piece of film, not only from the aspect of the acting, the writing, and the suspense, but also the practical effects that were done in 1982 by Rob Bettine and uh, ILM and Stan Winston's Creature Shop are brilliant and still hold up today. This is so, so cool. Rob Bettine is the one person that I would chomp at the bit to meet, but he's no longer in the film industry and doesn't have anything to do with it at all. But he was a brilliant special effects technician and special effects artist. And the work that they did on that, and in the silliest of ways, uh, was absolutely wonderful. Um, the, 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 the chest mouth scene yeah. where the doctor is. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, his arms yeah. Off. yeah, yeah. Spoilers. So <laughs> that, that, this, is, this is the brilliance of that scene. So the actor that played the doctor, they took a mold of his face and made a rubber mask. They then hired an actor that was a double amputee put the mask on his face, made hands and forearms that were made out of wax. Uh, the bones were made out of, um, I believe, uh, slightly harder plastic. And then they had a hydraulic mouth that actually closed and bit the wax hands off of this guy. No way. And then for the scene where his head tears off after he's on fire, it was a 16 hour job to set up that shot. And all that garbage and stuff in the neck as it tears apart, it was a mixture of molten plastic and bubble gum and different chemicals, right? So while they're filming this, they realized they needed to have flame in the scene because they just set him on fire. So they got one of those gas grill bars that gives off a little bit of flame when you put propane through it. So they'd have flame at the bottom of the scene so it would get that reflection. Well, that open flame mixed with all the chemicals from everything inside that caused an explosion and it blew up the whole effect. Six, 16 hour setup and the whole thing gets blown up, right? And Rob Bettine standing there and he goes, oh my God, it's on fire. And the director yells at him, well, put it out, you idiot. <laughs> and then they had, and then we had to spend another 16 hours setting up the shot. Oh my Do it again. God. Yeah. Wow. I, that is a movie that I absolutely adore uh, for a lot of reasons. And it's just, to me, it's John Carpenter's best work. Yes. Uh, it's I absolutely agree. magnificent. I uh, agree and you can sit and watch that over and over and over again and notice different details mm -hmm. every time because they put so much into it. Like when the dog first goes into the room and all you see is the silhouette. Yeah. You know who that actor was that the silhouette was? No. It was none of the actors at all. It was actually one of the sound guys. It was done that way. It was done that way so that you couldn't figure out who it was by silhouette. <laughs> and then next time you watch it, pay attention to the keys. I'm gonna watch it tonight. Yeah, I was gonna say now I want to watch the thing. <laughs> yeah, pay attention. So I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you a couple That's little things cool. to look for. Pay attention to the coats hanging up on the wall. 
okay. and pay attention to who has the keys. <laughs> that it is, it is so brilliant how these details are added in and never focused on. Yeah. And there's dead giveaways that aren't dead giveaways. There's almost like these fake clues in the background of different shots. Right. And it's the continuity. You think there's a continuity mistake. It's not. It's not a continuity mistake. Absolutely everything was done on purpose. Really? And it's just so beautifully done that now I want to go watch it. And <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to watch it right now. Actually. That's That honestly, when you think about it, to put that, that's phenomenal storytelling. It's, yeah. it's just oh, it's ridiculous. brilliant. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I love it. And that's why I was so disappointed with what they did to 2011's The Thing, the, the prequel. Right. Because a lot of people still think it's a remake. They marketed oh. it. They marketed it terribly. They did an awful job of marketing the film. And then the the when they made the film, they did these absolutely magnificent practical effects, beautiful practical effects that mimic the work of Rob Bettine and ILM and Stan Winston, excuse me. And when the film was very nearly done with filming, almost almost ready to wrap, the producers came forth and said, overlay all of the practical effects with CGI mm. and ruin the look of the movie. Absolutely ruined it. Yeah. I agree with you on that because I saw the remake or what they call the remake. Yeah, it's a prequel. It's, yeah. the, it's the, the story at the Norwegian base right before. Now, it bookends perfectly with the 1982 film. But it's just, and, and I also love in the 1982 film that if you speak Norwegian, the whole plot is given away right at the beginning of the movie. Is yeah. it really? No, yeah. The, the Norwegian, uh, the guy with the rifle that jumps out, that they end up killing. Yeah. He's yelling at him. The dog is not right. The dog is not right. Stay away from the dog. <laughs> the dog is not a dog. And they like it gives away the whole plot. So when they released it in Norway and any of the other uh, 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 Nordic countries up there, the Northern European countries, they all Scandinavian. They all kind of speak roughly the same language and they can all understand each other at least a little bit because a lot of the words cross over, they changed it entirely, what he was saying, mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't give away the plot in Scandinavian countries. Mm -hmm. They made it to where it was almost unintelligible because they didn't want to give it away. Yeah. But there's all these little clues, all these breadcrumbs left for you. But then if you try to follow the trail, you'll get confused because it all contradicts itself because the thing is a contradiction into, unto itself. It doesn't want to be found. So they added that into the storyline. That's crazy. Yeah, because yeah, there's all the de de there's all the debate at the end, the child's breath and the drinking. Here. Yeah, and that comes down to where they filmed it. <laughs> well, oh, is mean, that all well, it is? Yeah, that that's comes not deliberate, right? No, so child's uh, that scene that end uh, the end scene with child's his scenes because of a scheduling conflict were filmed in a studio, whereas oh. Kurt Russell was filmed at the uh, the copper mine where they filmed it at, and it's funny that the Norwegian or the, uh, the Arctic base, when you see scenes of it, where you're looking at the Arctic base, right on the other side of it is a whole bunch of trees and uh, mining equipment. And they just blocked it all off with the facades of the buildings when they made that film. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to go well, watch the thing now. I, I, sure. I, I got to ask you one last question, bro. Of and course. Yeah. And then we'll be done. As far as the thing goes, what are your thoughts on the ending? On the ending? Yes. What are your so, thoughts? When as, as, as to like who was who at the end? What, 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 what do you, I mean, because it, 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 it's a question mark ending. You know it is I very mean? much, yeah. So, so it was sort of answered in 2001. Um, PS2 game, The Thing, was released. And um, John Carpenter was involved in the making of the game. He actually voiced one of the characters in the game mm -hmm. and he considered it the sequel to, to, to 1982's The Thing. And it explains that Childs froze to death. He did, he was a human and he died. And that McCready also survived and shows up in the video game again and was also not a thing. So they were both humans at the end of that, according to uh, the, the video game that John Carpenter says is a sequel. So from that point of view, yes, if you look at the comic books, Childs was the thing, and so was McCready. Oh, they, they were know. both they were both infected in one version of the story. They were both infected. 
Uh, and in one version of the story, Childs was infected. And in one version of the story, McCready was infected. It really depends on which source you look at. But I personally believe they were both human. Um, Cause you never see him use a Jack Daniels bottle as a Molotov cocktail. Right. So that he uses wine bottles. Right. Because those were smash glass bottles that were easy to make at the time. And that's what that was about. But. And if you they're going to go to that length to put all of those little. Yeah. Easter eggs yeah. in. They're Actually, not gonna... does, I think he does use a Jack Daniels bottle once, but he's also a big fan of whiskey. So he's, he's always drinking something. And it's not, you know, he's drinking just rock that bullshit, but. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's so wild that you own that dude. Yeah. Because <laughs> I love not that, like that but it's just sitting next to you. Like, yeah, oh, the so many freaking yeah, I have, uh, I actually have an incomplete uh, uh, spider head uh, over Are there as well. Serious? Yeah, I'll turn the camera around here. So this is more shit. Uh, but there it is. Right there. Oh, Holy crap, that. dude. <laughs> that is super fucking cool, bro. I can see yeah. why you like coming to work all the time, dude. <laughs> oh, I, love it. I, love it. I mean, like I have I have a six foot painting of Vigo the Carpathian from Ghostbusters 2 over there that um scares the shit out of people all the time. I mean, right there is a Terminator. Oh, look at that. Oh, good God. <laughs> This is what my this is what my job is. <laughs> you guys are seeing it here on a lot's happened since yesterday. Mike, thank you so much for coming of on. Course, yeah. You're amazing guest. This is so much fun to explore into these things that we normally don't have any mm -hmm. knowledge of. You know what I mean? So yeah. thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, <laughs> can I plug can I plug some bullshit before yeah, I plug, plug, here, plug you can plug whatever the hell you want? want. All right. Um, so uh, I can be found anywhere on social media at props to history. I have my own podcast, the Prop History Podcast, which you can find on Spotify, iTunes, etc. And then my website, which is mts-props.com. Um, I sell prop replicas on there. And if I also do prop rentals. So if you have a prop that needs to be made or you're looking for something, contact me there for uh, any film productions you have going on. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, thanks yeah. for coming on, bro. We really yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate that's it. Great, All, right, All right, ladies and gentlemen. Like always, go support art, go support people, go check out Mike, go check out Props to History. You're going to be fascinated. I, I, It's a rabbit hole you're going to fall down, I promise. Uh, Mike, thank you for showing up. Thank you for coming yep. on. Cheers, fellas. Cheers, guys. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Be good humans. Always forward. Peace. Props to History.